First we look a little bit at the second reading from St. Paul's the Letter of the Romans, then we're going to look at the first reading and of the Gospel. And we're going to see a central theme here and how we carry out that theme. Just briefly, the theme is the virtue of humility. And we're going to look at that virtue and how we are to practice it. First of all, in this second reading, from the letter of Paul to the Romans, he tells us what he, um, he tells us, he speaks of the Spirit. If we don't have that Spirit within us, then we don't have life. We don't have eternal life. Here he's speaking on the same terms that our Lord speaks frequently in the Gospels particularly referring to himself in the Eucharist, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have eternal life within you. So when our Lord, when St. Paul here speaks of the Spirit, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, of course, along the same terms that our Lord speaks frequently in the Gospels. And he's saying the same thing our Lord says, if we don't have that Spirit, right? not necessarily meaning that we full of energy and go out and we're spirited, as they say, and we just go on and on and on. But he's saying, if you have truly the Holy Spirit within you, you are going to act and live exactly as God wills you to live. We are going to live a Christian life, the life following Christ. We are going to live a life that leads us to heaven, leads us to union with God. And what St. Paul here is telling us, if we live according to that Spirit, according to the Holy Spirit, according to heaven. If we are looking straight for heaven, then we will experience also what our souls first experience in our bodies as well. So we must live, yes, guided by the Holy Spirit, but always meaning towards that union with God. It's fine if we have a good bit of energy and we go out and share. But what's important is that everything we do, everything we undertake, leads us towards that. Not toward for any self-gratification or glorification here on earth, but towards our union with God, ultimately, in heaven. Now a little look. First of all, we look at the first reading from the prophet Zechariah. That one. It'll show us how we have to practice humility, and that is how we achieve that spirit. That's how we open the way for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Because the, the reading from Zechariah is an explicit prediction, pr prediction of what occurred on Palm Sunday when our Lord triumphantly entered Jerusalem. And call it was on the colt of an ass. It was on a colt. Very humbly, he entered Jerusalem. They were coming out to honor him and praise him as their king, basically, which in fact, he was a direct descendant, and that's also the point in the prophecy, he says, son of David. And our Lord was a direct descendant of David, so he was of the kingly family. He was of that direct line. So he was legitimately king. But how does he come out? Not on a triumphant, well-decorated animal with all the jewelry and the finery of a royal, of royalty, but in all simplicity on a colt. And they come out and strew the brown palm branches and olive branches in front of him. Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, not Hail, King of Jews. Hail, Son of David. Hosanna, Son of David. They call out. It's all fulfilled. That prophecy from Zechariah was all fulfilled on that day. But what did he come to do to take over a physical kingdom and become their king? No. He came to save or suffer his passion and death. His throne was the cross. His crown was the crown of thorns. See, it was in all humility. And then in the gospel passage, well, first of all, our Lord gives a prayer to the Father praising him that all of these things, that is, all of this revealing, that all that our Lord has revealed to his disciples, 
The Father has given him to reveal. Basically, he's revealing the Father. He's revealing his own divinity, as it were. Right? All of these mysteries, he's revealing to his disciples, he said, I thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned. Those who would be so popped with pride, they think they're the ones doing everything. But you have saved it. You have revealed it to the little ones. Those who become, as our Lord says elsewhere in the Gospel, like the little children. Innocent. Humble. Simply honest. Simply telling the truth. You see? The little ones. That's what he's telling us we have to be. And then, and then actually, quite a mystery through here, no one knows the Son except the Father, which is true. No one knows the Father as he is except the Son who came down. And by coming down as one of us, as man, while retaining his divinity, he reveals the Father as well. We know and understand the Father through the Son. So anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him, to whom did he reveal them? Reveal. We well, just set it up above. The little ones. They are the ones who would be open to receiving what our Lord was teaching as he was teaching it and truly live it. In all humility, to repeat. And then our Lord gives on quite a phrase here that's quite a great hope for us. He says, take my yoke upon me, yoke being burden." upon you, where I am meek and humble of heart. So he's telling us exactly how we have to be. And you will find rest for yourselves. Now we look at what was that yoke of our Lord? What does he take upon him? The cross, the suffering. And we're going to sit, when we look at that and we say, whoa, that's easy. That's light. That's the last words he says. My yoke is easy. My burden light. That's going to be light. We're going to find rest with that. Well, the answer is a resounding yes. There will be the suffering. Yes, we all have to go through it. That's part of our test of our love for God. That's the test we have to pass. But if we are truly living according to that spirit of St. Paul was speaking, if we are truly living according to the will of God, we're going to willingly accept that suffering. And it will be a great joy. We will find that rest, that peace. It's when we seek to resist it, when we seek only what makes me feel good and happy and joyful now. That's, we may find a little bit of enjoyment, enjoyment first, but it passes and then what? You see, it only pa it passes. It won't last. And that's when we're going to find it all the more difficult. But if we accept that suffering willingly, that doesn't mean we can't help better ourselves, but we certainly want to accept whatever cross our Lord deigns to send us, whatever suffering that is involved, whatever sacrifice that we can offer, we're going to find a great joy because we are fulfilling His will. We are coming closer to Him. We are uniting ourselves with Him. You look at the lives of the saints, particularly the martyrs. That was always a great joy, and they showed that, showed that joy. In many cases, you would hardly ever know they were suffering so tremendously. Perhaps one of the most classic examples we have in our own day and age with that of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, a well, blessed Teresa of Calcutta now, who suffered a tremendous coldness for 45 years. Nobody knew. Only her spiritual director knew. No one else ever knew. She always exhibited such a joy, always a smile, always that meek and always humble, just as our Lord says. No one would have never known that she was going through such a tremendous suffering. But when she came to understand that that suffering was a share in his cross, or the way she put it, he was reaching down from the cross to kiss her. She accepted it willingly, and it was a great joy. Very tremendous suffering, very hard to endure, but she was able to accept it with joy because it was uniting her closer to him. She was sharing 
in his passion and death. She was sharing in his love. And that's really what our Lord is asking of us. In all meekness, in all humility, we must seek to practice these. We must accept this suffering. Whatever suffering, whatever sacrifice it means, we do that willingly. We are sharing in his love. He is reaching down to kiss us too. Now, let's look a little bit at humility. Because that's how we're going to find that meekness too. Now, the classic definition of humility might seem a little strange at first, but it's, it's, it's what it is. Humility is truth. Now, how, when we look at that, humility is truth? Truth, yes. When we are truly practicing humility, we are simply practicing the truth. We look at ourselves. What is the truth about ourselves? Are we really that great as we sometimes make ourselves out to be? Are we, ever, are we the ones with all these great things? We look at, at, we can look at again the lives of some of the saints and some of the holy people, of, well, saints, they are now. And I think of some saints like St. John Paul II, again, Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, how much they accomplished in their lives, how many things they did, how much traveling they did, which, such monumental work, much of which still carries on today. Were they doing that themselves? They will be the first to tell you, no, it was God's work. God was working through them. God was doing that work. They were simply the docile instruments. That's the truth we have to look at. See, that's, it's not ourselves. We're not doing it ourselves. We wouldn't be capable. Can you imagine one human being do exactly everything that St. John, John Paul II did, or Mother Teresa of Calcutta? One human being able to do all of that on a natural level. There's no way. But with the grace of God, God has given this work to do, then we can. They did. Why? Because they were simply giving themselves back to God. And He was working through them. That's what it is. And that's what we have to look at. No, we're just weak little nothings compared to God. There's the truth. Alone, we can't handle it. Alone, we will never achieve our salvation. We could never achieve that union with God. But with the grace of God, we need only see the words of our archangel Gabriel to Mary. Nothing shall be impossible to God. With the grace of God, we can do it all. Whatever God wills of us, that's what our Lord is speaking of here. We approach it in all truth, His will. Whatever He wills of us. I don't know anything about it, but if this is what you want me to do, I will do it. Right? That one is a phrase from Mother Angelica, who is still alive today. But she did the same thing, accomplished the monumental work that is still being carried on today. All right, nothing short of the world's single, largest single media network. Catholic media network. She knew nothing of any of that when she started. In fact, she didn't have that, was not in her mind at all. When she made her deal with God so that she would walk again, she said, I will go down to the south. She was in Ohio at the time. I will go down to the south and work with the poor people down there. That was her intention. She walked again. She fulfilled her wish. She fulfilled that deal. She went down to the south. But God had completely other designs in mind for her. Something, a monumental work she had no idea of, nor how to do it or accomplish it at all. She knew nothing of that. But that was what God willed of her. That was the work he gave her. And she accomplished it. And she herself repeated it many times. This is God's work. So many people wonder how this one single contemplative nun could accomplish so much, which others tried and couldn't do. How could she do that? And she said it. It's God's work. God was doing it through her because she was so given completely to Him. All that mattered was that union with Him, a spousal union with Him, a complete, intimate, total union with Him. That's all that mattered. And he was working through her. 
It was his work. That's how that was accomplished. Now, with that work, and it was no less for someone like, like her, like Mother Angelica, it always meant two things. Much intense prayer and suffering. Again, we might look just looking, following along with all the work she did while she was still able to, before she suffered her stroke and hemorrhage and could no longer work, but at that point, it was always with, she was jovial, she was always with a joke, always smiling, always, all right, very happy. With as much suffering as she went through all the whole time, but she could go on, carry on with so much energy. And you wouldn't have known how much intense suffering was involved, but it was, always. Every time, one of the, there were several, one after the other, in order to accomplish that work, the miracles that occurred. At the moment of a prayer, everything that she needed came, instantly. But it was always meant this prayer, intense prayer and intense suffering, each time. But she willingly accepted that. And each time it occurred until she built up, as I said, this monumental work that is still carrying on today. <coughs> but it's that acceptance of it, willingly allowing ourselves to be his docile instruments, just his instruments. He will then guide us through. It's his work. We may never see the work we do, what that's accomplished, and that's fine. That way we don't get puffed up with pride and say, look, see what I can do. No. To repeat, it's not we who are doing that. God is working through us because we have given himself, ourselves to him, his will. And he accomplishes this work through us. doesn't matter if we see it or not. What's important is that always we simply give ourselves to him as his docile instruments, knowing that we alone, we're just weaklings, nothings, so we can't do it. Right? That's another thing here that our Lord, the point makes here when he says, I'm, you know, I thank you for having revealed only to the little ones. Now to whom is he referring here? Primarily his disciples who were in fact, they were about to carry out and accomplish again what a monumental work in spreading this gospel, the faith, to all the known world. And they would work in, not just in their own native languages, but several languages. Including the evangelists, who would write in Greek mostly, rather than their own native Aramaic. They were not educated. All right? They were those weak little ones, who really had no indication, not necessarily any capability. They were, most of them were fishermen. They had no education, no training. For this. The only other one, maybe a little bit, St. Matthew, who was a tax collector. Otherwise, very little. And our Lord himself was not thought to be educated either. You understand, he was known to be a carpenter, builder, who would have had no education. Yet, he could speak with such authority. How they, you know, they all commented on that one. Who is this who speaks with such authority, who does all of these works? Accomplishes so much. And he tells us why, how that is. For I am meek and humble of heart. Here, he's actually passing back to the Father, the Father working through him. He's simply being obedient to the Father. He is God himself, so of course he has the power and the authority to do all he does. But you see, it's in acknowledging that truth that we are weak, we are nothing before God. But God is everything, and through Him we can accomplish whatever He wills. We just be His instruments. There is that humility we must practice, and if we will truly practice that humility, there will follow that meekness. We needn't worry about anything or get over-anxious. God is working through us. That's all that matters. doesn't mean we sit back and do nothing. That's not it either. God's not calling us to just sit back. We have to act. We have to live the faith we profess. So we have to do, but we have to be willing to do whatever God tells us to do, whatever he gives us to do, including all the sacrifice that is necessary to carry it out. All the discomfort, the, the suffering, all right? Whatever we have to give up of ourselves to be able to do it, including our own wills, which is the most difficult thing to give up. 
But that's what we have to do. Then we are following him like, the, well, we are then, those little ones who follow him docilely. Here I am, Lord. Will you tell me what you want me to do? I will do it. In fact, our mother Angelica once prayed that way. You're showing me now you're bringing me into a television network? Hey, I don't know anything about transmission. I don't know anything about this. But if this is what you want me to do, I will do it. And she did it. That's being the docile instrument. That's the humility we must practice. I don't know it. I don't know how to do it. This is what you give me to do? I will do it. As God is working through us, it's His work. I repeat, all, what, all that's necessary is that union with God. We must pray for it every day and then seek to live it. To be exactly as our Lord said, meek and humble of heart. And no matter what the suffering, no matter what the sacrifice we have to offer, and let's not hesitate to offer it, let's not be afraid, we will find peace. We will find our rest. Praise be Jesus and Mary.